Hi everyone, my name is Declan McGlynn. Welcome to Friday Forum Live. Point Blank's weekly broadcast bringing you exclusive tutorials, artist interviews and industry insight every Friday live from East London. Today I'm joined by our head of school, JC Concado, to go back to basics with one of the most important techniques in modern dance production, and that's compression. <laughs> So understanding compression can not only help you shape your sounds, but can improve your whole mix dramatically. But with varying types, controls, responses and results, it can be a bit confusing to know when to use and how to use it. What we're going to look at today is just scratching the surface. So if you want to dive deeper into mixing and sound engineering, check out our diploma courses on our website, pointblanklondon.com. And remember, we are completely live. So if you have any questions for me or JC, let us know in the chat. And we've had quite a lot of people who've been asking questions already, so shout out. To, I'm just going to name some of the guys. Ryan Horvat, Tim James, Borders of the Sun, David Costa. All great questions coming in. High foam beats as well. You know, keep them coming. We'll get to them throughout the show. So, JC, welcome back. Welcome. Thank it's you. Friday. It is Friday the 13th. Yes, I'm a bit nervous. Hopefully everything goes OK. Uh, uh, me, me too. Me too. Let's, uh, so, compression. Compression. I mean, it's one of those things that, like, everyone kind of sees it as it's like, oh, just compress it and it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. A fix-all tool. But yeah, it's, yeah. in doing that, it can be mess completely mess up a mix if you don't understand it, it, it could yeah it yeah. Ab absolutely it, it, it really could and also i think the fact that our compressors sometimes are set up in some daw by yeah. default yeah i think maybe are also leading to that confusion sometimes yeah. you know yeah, uh, yeah. and we'll talk about it makeup gain and all those kind of why you know mm -hmm. uh, so compressor so yeah back to basic today um and um yeah th that's the kind of content we deal with in the Mixing dance music course or art of mixing on our HE courses. Mm -hmm. We've got a whole week dedicated to compression and type of compression and circuit type from hardware to software, yeah. emulation, different techniques, when, why you want to compress. So, we'll kind wanna, of glance at all those today. We, 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 yeah. We'll glance at the basic and go back to, we decided we thought it would be a good idea to do a, a back to one on one. Yeah. The very basics of compression. So, first of all, what is a compressor? Obviously, compressor is to control the dynamic of a signal, mm -hmm. uh, and it does that by reducing the signal above and is dictated by a threshold. Signal above that threshold are being compressed a certain amount, a certain way, and, and that's the basic concept of it. Uh, as a result, there are several things, in reality there are several things that you can do with compression as we know, from uh, smoothing out a performance, limiting the peaks, uh, but also by the nature of the parameters of a compressor, you can also shape the sound quite drastically. Mm -hmm. Give it to energy, smooth out, uh, shape the attack, the release of a sound, all through those various parameters and also type of compressors. Obviously, a type of compressor is, is quite important mm -hmm. and we'll look at some of the logic one. We're all go going to do it natively with logic, I think it would be the the best way to do it. Yeah, because Logic has some new compressors. Well, uh, there's this whole discussion, are they new or are they not? Uh, there's a new one, which is the vintage VCA, I believe. Uh, so that is a new one. They've revamped the whole interface. They've also got rid of some of the features, such as the hard and soft knee, for example. So it's not there anymore? It's not there anymore, uh, bearing in mind. So we'll, we, we, we'll touch on some of those. Okay. And, uh, okay. and they look different. Do they sound radically different or do they look different and therefore we think they sound a little bit different? I'm still unsure about um, for us to decide. Yeah. Cool. So, um, so I've got this track and to, to illustrate it, it's a track taken from the, our new Trance and EDM course. Uh, so I thought, you know, let's use that. It has vocal, which was recorded here. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to illustrate with the vocal because I think uh, the more dynamic the track is, the better we can illustrate compression. Uh, there's two different ways, you know, if you, if you start with MIDI and stuff uh, and it's heavily contact, let's say a 4 on the 4 kick, always at the same level, you're going to use compressor for a different reason yeah. than you would for a vocal or a guitar or a live, a live part. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I've got this vocal part here and I'm probably going to solo it first to start illustrating some of those techniques and probably get rid of the effects to start with. And I've got two compressors on it and uh, I'm going to bypass them all. So. I'm going to start with the basics of it, and, and, and there are two different approaches to compressing. I mean, there are several, more than two, but the main two one when you put your compressor as an insert, we're not even going into parallel and all that kind of yeah. stuff at the moment. Um, as you put it on an insert, there, there are two reasons you would compress. One is to reduce the peak, 
and uh, obviously all the all those attack and you know all those peaks here that we see uh, you can kind of shave them off a little bit to, to even out. Uh, but there's also another approach which is smoothing out a performance between uh, here, you know, different low, the, the words that are a bit lower, the phrase that are a bit lower, the, the, the phrase that are a bit, you, you want to try within a phrase, maybe the beginning of a word, the end of a word or a word, you know. Mm -hmm. So you can smooth out that. So there's two different approach to do that. So let's start looking at this compressor. I'm going to use this red compressor, uh, which I believe is based on the Focusrite Red, uh, quite famous hardware. Yeah. It was a VCA type, and they've called it Studio VCA. So again, you see there's no peak or IMS. Um, from what I know about this compressor, and we'll talk about it, but let, let, let's start going through the, 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 the threshold and mm -hmm. ratio first. So we're going to do a bit first. I'm going to, the first approach I'm going to go for is peak reduction. Try to. So to do that, usually. Today the sun le, seems so actually, I'm going to take a, 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 a part which is a bit louder. Me go so I'm going to put it in now. So, and uh, there's this new graph mode which is quite useful Never again to learn, I think, for people who want to learn. Where pre peak reduction, what you're going to be Never doing is basically set your threshold to decide here which. Le from which level, from which line of level, it is being compressed. Mm -hmm. So the way I like to define uh, the threshold is it's pretty much how often the compressor kicks in. How often you're kicking the compressor, you're entering the threshold. That's your threshold. And the relation with the ratio is by how much. That's how you need to see okay. it. Now, obviously, you, there's several ways you can achieve 6 dB if you look at this meter more here. There's lots of ways if you wanted to, let's say, achieve 6 dB of reduction. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do that, depending on your threshold and your ratio. But what you need to understand is not the same content will be compressed depending on your... You may get the same reduction, but it won't be the same element of the signal that is being compressed, and by how much. So let me illustrate that. At the moment, let's say I'm going to go for a radical. And uh, let's, see, let's go around a 6 dB reduction here, yeah? Never let me go. Okay, so I could achieve that that way. But I could also probably achieve it like that and by increasing the ratio, but obviously lowering Never the threshold. Let me go. You see here? I'm getting the same amount of reduction. However, my settings between threshold and ratio Never is quite different. Let me go. With these settings, I'm only eating the compressor on certain line, but when I'm heating it, I'm compressing it by quite a lot. Okay. And let's illustrate by the graph here. You, know, you see? You know who and I'm not compressing all the time, okay. only on the attack. So the so, vocals going in, it's being compressed less, but when it is, it's being compressed more. Exactly. Yeah. But less of it is being compressed. Okay. So think of it, I think, I hope it helps clarify the difference between threshold and ratio. Threshold is how often, ratio is by how much. Yeah. And I think that that's a good way to, 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 to put it forward. So with a, with a peak compression, usually you're, 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 with a peak reduction approach, you're going to want that kind of a, approach, of only on the peaks. So I don't want it to compress anywhere else. So a good way, again, to set up your ratio is to put quite a bit of ratio, so you, you've got a better seeing on how the meter reacts. Set your threshold and then put your ratio back to where you feel it's right. So let, let's do that now with a peak approach. Setting up. Never let me go. So gentle here, and I'm gonna go back off a little bit. And all you need to know. So you see, I'm, not, I'm only doing it on the peaks now. Let's go back here on this part. Come dance you see here, it's not compressing on this part, on the quiet part. And that kind of helps already, and I'm dealing with the peaks here. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a peak approach. Now, typically with a peak approach, um, let's go with fast and attack now. Let's move on those two parameters. Mm -hmm. um, attack is how fast the compressor kicks in, once, once the across. signal has crossed the threshold. And the release is how, how long it takes for the compressor to come back non-compressed once the th signal has gone below the uh, above the threshold, so not being compressed anymore. 
Okay? So with a peak reduction, typically you're going to want a fairly fast attack because you want to control the peak. Uh, and the release, you probably want it to come back in a natural way. But one of the issues with release is often that if you make a release too short, it can distort the sound. I mean, you don't really notice it on limiters if the release is too short. Uh, but you don't want it to stay when you reduce the peak, obviously. All you want is the compressor to, the vocal peaks, compressor kicks in, the vocal doesn't peak anymore, compressor is not here. Therefore, a release which is quite short, mm -hmm. uh, natural. Uh, you can use an auto as well, which often can work really well. Ever and here we've got, that gives us that result. Let's compare. And it brings us to this uh, makeup game. For me, the key with compression is that the, one of the problems is that by nature, compressors often come with auto makeup gain. Uh, therefore, as soon as you, especially in, a, in logic, and they mm -hmm. still, still do that. So as soon as you put that on, the compressor sounds better. It doesn't sound better, it sounds louder. Therefore, you think it sounds better. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's one of the tricks of the years. Yeah. I that think sounds that, that is one of the main reasons that people think compression is a fix-all tool. Because Abs as soon as you put it on, wow, it sounds big. Yeah. You know. And one of the things, and uh, let, let's look at bringing a new compressor, actually, just uh, to, to illustrate that um, compressor here. Look, if it comes here, they've come with minus 12 auto makeup gain. And in some cases, they can come sometimes with soft, as what I've seen sometimes presets coming with soft distortion. That straight away make it sound louder as well. So what is key is to make sure that you bypass, once you've compressed, you bypass and you set up your makeup change, makeup gain, and it should be the same level. Therefore, you're in a good position to say, is my compressor, my compression, improve the sound? It's scarcely the same level. Now, there's a misconception auto about auto makeup gain. You see, let's go back to my metering here. I'm hitting 4, 5 dB. Some people would think that you should put your makeup gain by 5 dB or 6 dB, if it's reducing by 6 dB. But the compression doesn't happen over a long period of time. Sometimes it's quite really sharp, especially like here, for example. So if you do by 6 dB, actually you're, it's, it's louder. You know, because the ear that needs to have a certain period of time to start adjusting to a certain time of level. If it's really short, the, the reduction in level, the ear that hardly perceives it, not as loudness. You know, it's this whole loudness versus metering and all those kind yeah. of stuff. So uh, here I've got to get... Let, Ever let me go I've got a makeup gain of 3 dB and that seems to be doing the trick. Never even though we're hitting the compressor go. by more in some places. So that's the thing about makeup gain. That's the main approach. So here we've got a kind of an approach of, I would say, peak reduction approach. Yeah. There's another approach that you can have with compressor, and it's smoothing out the performance. Um, I'm going to take that one off, actually. We don't need it anymore. Uh, and let's use that one. This one is based on an opto probably optical, modal, uh, vintage opto, typical vintage, the classic would be an LA2A, for example. Yeah. And we're going to go into those different modes after that. So a different approach with compressor is instead of setting a threshold that the compressor kicks in only when the signal is too loud, let's say, yeah. you are actually bringing the threshold, what we say, more in the music, more in the sound. Therefore, it's compressing pretty much all the time, pretty much, but with a much lower ratio typically 2.1, maybe 3.1, you know, whereas with the peak, you would have a much higher ratio, 4.1, 6.1, 10, 8, you know, mm -hmm. th those kind of like quite aggressive compression, but only in certain moments. Okay. With, uh, with when you, this kind of smoothing the performance, is compressing all the time, you're changing, what you're doing basically is compressing the top level and bringing up the low level, which is why in, back in the days of tape, compressor would bring hiss. And it's the same, you know, if you've got a noisy recording, my preamp, you put compressor, it's going to bring that up. It's going to bring all the low level sound of the mouth, breathing. You know, all those sounds are going to be brought up with compression, with that technique of compression. Um, so let, let, let's illustrate that uh, slightly differently. So you see here, now we're compressing pretty much all the time. And here you can go with a gentle you ratio. Know, you know who, never let me 
question all the time, but you see it's smoothing out. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the attack in Wheaties, when you smooth out performance, if it's, I, I would tend to go with a slightly slower attack and probably a, a slightly longer release. The longer the release, the more smooth your compression makes it. Obviously, you want to make sure that it's not too long, so it has time to recover when mm -hmm. it's not compressing. Uh, so, so it wouldn't be uncommon to use peak reduction and but exactly, especially on the vocal, especially yeah. on the vocal on live bass. With live instrument, it's not unusual to have two compressors, at least you know. Mm. And I'm not even talking parallel here, mm. just purely. And uh, and actually, let's illustrate here. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. Is uh, we've got two compressors working together. That's without the compressor. Well, without each. And all you need to know. You see how it has brought up? We hear the, 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 the throat a bit you more. We yeah. hear a little bit more the, the breathing. Yeah. Um, and and uh, let, let, let's try to bring it in the track now. It's now the compressor, you know, and it's one of the things about compression. It makes element, helps element to sit in your mix. Yeah, and one of the points in this, in this particular example is that the attack is slow on the second compressor, yeah. but it's not effective and it doesn't sound too poppy because the first compressor is As catching a, the peak. Ah, exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, it's not. And, and one of the great things after that with compressors is obviously. Here, if, I, if, I, if you tend to, the, the slower the attack, you start bringing, because you compress after the, the initial transient and with the makeup gain, what it means is that the attack seems a bit more prominent. Yeah. And it's great if you want to bring a bit of presence to mm -hmm. vocal, for example, or to any sound. Obviously, with drums, it's a typical trick of, yeah. you know. So that, 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 that is our basic of compressor. Okay? There's one more thing that we need to consider when we keep on talking about the, the, those parameters before we go into compressor types, is peak and RMS. And I think we've got a couple of questions. Yeah, a couple of guys were asking about that. So. Uh, and it's, uh, peak and RMS, it happens at the, 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 the sidechain, at the level of the sidechain. The sidechain in the compressor is the part of the compressor that detects the incoming signal mm -hmm. and decide how the compressor after that reacts, how your threshold, how your ratio, how your fast, how, how your attack and release yeah. behaves and, and, and work. It's all based on the detection, original detection. Mm -hmm. Now, certain compressors have different type of, and, and it's peak and RMS, and it's the same as metering. Peak is quick and it detects the peaks mostly, but it's not really good uh, at doing an average, but it's really good for all the transient. Closer, faster sounds. Yeah. Exactly. Whereas the RMS is more on the overall general average loudness of taking. So some compressors, and before in Logic, we used to have a peak and RMS function on all the compressors. Now, that if you've seen, they, they, they got rid of them on, I think, pretty much every single compressor. I haven't seen a single one. Uh, but if somebody knows about it, please let us know. Uh, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen it in the side. Ah, yeah, in the side chain here, we, we've got it here, actually. Okay, so it is still in there, is it? Yes, but not on all of them, because they've right. started to emulate. And maybe it was the same on the interface, I don't remember if I'm totally honest. But you see this one, you've got the peak or IMS, but this one hasn't. Uh, this one hasn't either. And actually, if you look at any of those modules of those emulation, they, they, they don't have. The reality is that very few hardware compressors have peak and IMS built in. They are by nature mm. peak or IMS. By the design. By the design, okay. exactly. And we're going to go into that. So the peak normally is better to control if you want that kind of peak reduction controlling. Yeah. A peak mode would be obviously suitable. And also drums and percussion. Having mm. said that, personally, I never use peak mode for drums mm. because I tend to want that kind of punchy sound. And it's the, the peak is very aggressive. Yeah. And it's great if you want to control something very quick. The, the transient, the attack. I find that as soon as you want to control longer notes, the peak is, is just too obvious. You hear, you really hear the peak, you know, mm -hmm. the peak, peak, peak mode. So RMS is better for, for me for that purpose. Um, and it leads us to some of those models. So the Studio VCA, like I was saying, is, looks like it's based on the Focusrite. The Focusrite was a VCA. The nature of VCA compressors are usually more transparent and fast, they're fast. 
the, I've read a little bit more about the, the, the red, and the red by default is more of a true than an RMS. Right. Doesn't mean that all VCAs are, are mm, I think most VCAs tend to be RMS, but I may be wrong, don't quote me on that. But that, that one is more designed with a peak mode than RMS detection, if okay. you like. Um, a FET, again, depends, but a FET compressor, by nature, uh, let's say this one is the classic FET is the 1176 compressor, the URI, uh, now Universal Audio do, do a new version of it. Uh, they are known to be really fast as well. So again, for fast, for peak limiting, I mean the 1176 is known as a peak limiter. Yeah. So therefore, again, very much in the peak mode rather than RMS. And it's quite known in terms of its sounding characteristic for being quite detailed, but also kind of tough sounding. It gives a bit of presence, a bit of bite to the sound. Uh, and then we've got the classic VCA, uh, that would be a DBX-160, more of a peak type of mode again, the, the DBX-160, I think. Uh, and then we've got a VT vint vintage VCA, that would be an SSL, more of an RMS type, but it, works, it can work fast as well. I mean, bear in mind, the VCA are so fast that you can deal with peaks anyway, even though it's an RMS mode. So you, you've got to understand those kind of two differences. And then you've got a vintage FET, which would be an older model, uh, usually they tend to be a little bit duller, a little bit more smoother. Uh, if you've got a sound which is too bright, it can help reducing that brightness as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same with the Opto. The Opto by default are, are, are slower and they're great for smoothing, for smoothing sound, vocal, bass, for example. They're, they're really great on that, uh, often used for that purpose. So those are the different compressors and obviously the hardware counterpart, the, the real thing, all have their characteristics. Some of them are bright, some of them are, are hard, some of them are smooth and, and, and engineers tend to use them. That's when we start getting into the whole compression of not only it's uh, controlling the dynamic and shaping the sound, but it's also not an EQ, but it co it, it's a color. Yeah, you know, you're gonna, you know, so for example, a dull, a dull vocal, I may try an 1176 because it brings that kind of sharp and bite to it and it may help that mean I don't have to EQ as much and the opposite if a vocal is a bit thin a bit nasal maybe an LA2A can be great warms up take off the edge yeah. so th th those are really the main uh, type obviously there's one model that they haven't it's the, the kind of variable mu type uh, the classic would be the Fairchild obviously uh, that, that is that has to be the Rolls Royce of compressors yeah. I suppose yeah, yeah absolutely um, and, uh, and also, but the Manley as well, the Manley yeah. is a variable mu as well. Um, they are slow, they are valve, very colorful. So that's the kind of, my kind of introduction to comp compression yeah. as a, as a summary. What, one of the main points to take away is a lot of the time people will see things like peak RMS or see makeup gain and they just won't touch it, they'll just leave it the way it's set in their DAW, but actually it makes a massive difference. It makes a massive difference. I know, I know in Ableton, it, it, it makes. peak is set by default, and yeah. that's something you have to watch out uh, for. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, the peak, I mean, by peak, you're gonna, usually you're going to get a much aggressive, you know, the, yeah. the, basically the, the, the sidechain reacts more quickly, so it usually gives you much more, but it, it's not subtle peak. Yeah. So that's why, t I tend personally, I recommend peak for short compression type, peak limiting, short, not too, so it's still transparent. You know, if you do a, a kind of heavy compression in peak mode, you're going to really hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are times that I use peak mode for uh, side chaining. Yeah, I was going to say when <laughs> for if example, you're using side because it's so yeah, it's so faster. so fast and also so so obvious. You know, it's so heavily compressed that yeah. that's actually what you want in the side chain effect. So peak mode, uh, I tend if I, if I want it to be really really over the top, I, I would. Yeah, cool. So we got, I mean, we got loads of questions already, even before we've begun broadcasting. But uh, I know someone asked about attack and release and about how, how do you know what settings to put attack at and how do you know what settings to put release at? And well, the, 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 the attack is about what, 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 what you want to do with the sound. You know, do you want, for example, let's say, uh, let's say you've got a bass or a vocal and you've got a massive click at the beginning. It could be a P or a T or, you know, that you've got those pronouns. So you, if you want to tame them, you, you're going to go for a fast attack. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's if you want to the D attack really shapes the, the transient the initial transient of a sound so a slow attack is going to bring up the transient once you've done your compression and your gain makeup and vice versa so that's how you know how to to select your attack okay. you know I how much one, you want to affect the, the one transient. technique that can help with that is bring the threshold down yeah very low yeah 
Yeah. Like shape your sound yeah. and then bring it back up. I mean, should, should we do quickly a quick example? Yeah, let's yeah, find let's if do. we've got maybe a sound that, that, that is good to illustrate. Let's, let's see. See if we've got something here that could we use. Uh, maybe a kick, actually. Maybe a kick. Why is the kick coming? Because I, I don't know that project. So I've just opened it this early on, so. Okay, well here we've got a kick, so let's see what mode is it. Okay, see now I must mod that one. Have you noticed a yeah. big, the huge difference, yeah? A bit different, yeah. I mean, even even if you had the speakers off, yeah. the difference is Yeah, you would have been. Yeah. Having said that, do you hear it that much? I think so. You they do. Attack, and attack. one of the reasons, yeah. but one of the reasons on the attack you don't hear it so much is because it's got a slow, a f uh, quite a fast attack, I suppose. Let's make it a bit more, actually. Yeah, now you're ready. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can really hear the difference yeah. there. Um, High Flom Beats asked us earlier, uh, how do you know when you need to compress something and how much of it is needed? Uh, I feel like sometimes I compress just to do it and it might not be necessary. I think yeah. that's a very common issue. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I used to do that all the time and, and, and I'm probably still victim of that to be yeah. honest. So, extent. like we mentioned earlier, it's, it's almost the makeup games. Mm. makes it sound so much nicer just yeah. because it's louder yeah. that you yeah. think, I'll, yeah. I'll put a compression. I mean, I remember one of the first uh, I was an assistant and uh, I was uh, helping a, a producer to do a remix on Erasure and I ended up mixing it. And uh, because I always saw people putting a compressor on the kick drum on the 909 kick, uh, first thing I went was compress on the kick, you know, and he looked at me and he said, do you think it sounds better? And I was like, well, no, not really. So why are you doing it? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've noticed 909 kicks, especially coming, you know, with one coming out of the drum machine. Typically, usually compressor doesn't work that well on them. Mm. You've got to be careful. Fast attack, you, you, you completely win the sound. So, I mean, when to know is, uh, well, compare at the same level. Is it better? Do you, need, do, you know, do you need, first of all, are you compressing, first of all, be clear, do you compress to change the dynamic on the vocal? Usually, you're going to need to. Live instrument, you're going to need to. Uh, so, that's the first aspect you should ask yourself. I'm, what am I compressing? Do I need to change the dynamic? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a live performance. I need to. Uh, and if it's not, why am I compressing? You know, I've seen people compressing hi hat, and sometimes it can work if you if if you're shaping the sound by doing it a certain way. The sound suddenly sounds different. It sounds better. That's totally fine, you mm -hmm. know. But if it's only for the sake of it, uh, I've seen people compressing hi hat so much that you know there was a nice programming going on with nice velocity, and by the end of it, you've lost totally the groove. So you can really ruin that, and suddenly it sounds really robotic. Yeah. Um, so we, we, with parts that are MIDI, more quantized, more controlled, because the dynamic is controlled by the programming, I think you need to look at am I what kind of sound do I want to achieve? You know, do I want to sh am I shaping it? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, well, that's, that's a really good point, because you, would you almost be better to go to the attack and release settings of your sampler on a kick? Instead of compressing, I would start with much that. More control. I would start with that, absolutely. Yeah. And then after that compression, you know, uh, there's a, this famous, famous quote from Tony Visconti, we need to say it, you know, but uh, compression is the sound of rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it is, you know, because as soon as it goes into a compressor, you, it feels that it's there, it's, it's sitting, it's tighter, and, 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 and then suddenly it's more of a, an aesthetic consideration while you're yeah. using compression. Uh, so, so that's probably why people tend to compress, you know, uh, ultimately quite, quite, quite a lot to get that kind of sound. Like I was saying before on bass, I compress because not only to compress, you know, if it's a sub bass that is really nicely programmed, I would probably more compress to, to get my bottom end, my, my sub in place, sitting, and compression is going to do that. Mm. Otherwise, it feels a bit more like free and pushing, yeah. you know. So, yeah, so we, after that, we're getting into the more subtle aspect of compression, all, all the different... Yeah. So um, I hope it answers the, 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 the question. 
Yeah, and the banana farm is asking, when shouldn't you compress, which is kind of what we talked about already, but uh, he's also asking, would you always use it across all tracks, even if only minimally? No, not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, like I said, you know, I mean, there, there may be a percussion, a shaker, a tambourine it doesn't need. If it doesn't need a compressor, I'm not going to put one on. Mm -hmm. uh, but it may also need one, you know, if the, the tambourine's got lots of attack and peak, then I will use a compressor. Yeah, I think and if you're working with samples, go to your sampler first for sound Yeah, shaking. shape the sound first, yeah. right. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, hopefully we can get through all of your questions, because there's quite a lot coming in. Um, uh, someone's asking about what's the best compression, what's, which compressor in your opinion has the most character for warmth on the master bus? We well, mentioned the Fairchild, of course. Well, obviously, yeah, yeah but um, it, it doesn't work for uh, everything, obviously. Uh, there's so many. I mean, the Neve are pretty nice, some of the Neve compressor. The SSL is not, is not really known for its warmth, but it glue things together and somehow it makes it still warm. Um, it, it depends, you know what I mean? I mean, there are tracks sometimes where you're going to put a Fairchild across and you think, yeah, that's the best one, you know, it's the Fairchild. And you put it on a, on, on a track like on an EDM track and it falls apart a little bit because it, 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 the transient, the directness of it, the clarity it has lost a little bit. It has lost a bit of its transparency. Yeah, and suddenly, I found that, yeah. And, and then suddenly you realize, well, actually, no, it doesn't, it, it's not working better, you know. Yeah. So different type, always try. I mean, we're in a world nowadays where, uh, back in the, time, the day of the studio, you, you didn't have that much time to try every single compressor on every single track. Um, we have a bit more luxury at home, so yeah. mm -hmm. try. Nice one. So 15th Signs asking, some compressors have a soft knee button. Yeah. I don't really understand what the function, uh, what the function of this is, so what's okay. it really used for? Uh, I think I'm going to go to this, uh, that's our course, one of the online course we have here, if we can show that. Um, and I think uh, we've got a page on that, so I'm going to show that and because the diagram is, is really useful to illustrate. Um, the, the R knee and soft knee detect how, how it's being compressed when it's past the threshold. Okay? So with the R knee, nothing happens until, to the sound until it reaches the threshold. As soon as it passes the threshold, it gets incompressed by, that ra by the ratio, that, by how much it's mm. been set by the ratio. With a soft knee, it's a smoother approach where basically before you hit the threshold, the signal starts being compressed before it hits the threshold. Therefore, it gives you that curve. If we look at it here, it gives you that curve. So it's a smoother compression because imagine a hard knee is very much not compressed, threshold, compressed. Yeah. And there's not really the transition. Uh, with a soft knee, as, you, as the sound approaches the threshold, a, a gentle compression starts, uh, therefore you've got that kind of curve. Again, you know, so by definition you could argue that soft knee, uh, and our knee and soft knee is on every single logic compressors, which again, some of those compressors that it emulates, we don't have that soft and mm -hmm. our knee, they are by default hard and soft knee. Uh, so, I mean, if you, if you think of a peak reduction, if you wanted something really to control the level really well, we are looking at peak, Hard knee, and that would give you the most control. Like as soon as it reaches threshold, bing, bang. Yeah, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> think of it that way. Yeah. And the, the smoothest would be soft knee, slow attack, yeah. RMS mode. Cool, nice one. That's that's actually really helpful, even for me as well. <laughs> um, uh, High flown beats is asking, should you? We kind of covered this already, but I think it is um, important to cover it again. Should you use makeup gain automatically or just the makeup gain yourself? Is uh, there ever a case to use auto makeup gain? No, I mean, uh, uh, do it yourself, trust your ears. Yeah. It's a good practice anyway, you know. We, uh, ear, hearing, when you mix, when you master, well, or, or everything you do as an engineer, on the engineering side of your production, uh, is about training your ears. So just the exercise of comparing, is it at the same level, setting up your chain, I think it's good practice for you uh, just as a training exercise. Mm. Yeah, totally. Uh, Anthony Laws is asking, is there a difference between EQing first and compressing second or vice versa? Yes, big time. Uh, I mean, the, the clear, I mean I'm mean, i going to take the, the most obvious example, but uh, let's say we, we, we've got a vocal, a recorded vocal, uh, and it has a bit of rumble, uh, whether it's people, you touching the, the mic stand or, uh, you know, that type of, that, that type of low. Mm. Uh, those kind of, again, compressors react to v low volume, are, of most energy, therefore the threshold react to that first. Uh, 
So if I put my compressor first without getting rid of this rumble that, I, that shouldn't be there in the first place, the compressor is going to react first to the rumble rather to the actual signal, the voice. Uh, so typically you're going to put your compressor, f uh, EQ first, pardon me, get rid of that rumble via EQ. Therefore, when you put the compressor, it starts reacting to the vocal rather yeah. than to the rumble. Would you, would you say as a general rule, corrective EQ first, compressor and sound shaping EQ? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like a signal yeah. tune. Yeah, so if, I, if, I, if we had to make a, yeah. 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 Cut out what you don't need, compress, yeah. boost what you yeah. like, yeah, yeah. yeah, kind of thing. Totally, yeah. totally, yeah. Cool, so we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. We are running out of time. Um, yeah, someone's already asked again about EQing first. Uh, let me just keep going here. The thing that we were saying with compression is it can be a little bit of a corrective EQ as well in itself. Yeah, someone's asking us to do an FFL by Dynamic EQ 101. This 101 is going to catch on, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, oh, there's some more, hold on a sec. I also wanted to ask you about multiband, which is something that someone has asked in the comments as well. But just briefly, multiband compression, should we ever, is there ever a case to use multiband in an actual individual channel within a mix, or is it always for the master bus? I mean, you've got different schools, so I'm not going to say, you know, uh, you're wrong or you're right. Personally, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of single band. Uh, <laughs> I hate multiband because I'm just scared that it's going to ruin everything and the, the relationship between the different bands itself and, you know, the crossover. You're, you're bringing some phasing issue and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. yes, on, on, on a single, especially if you work with samples, let's say, if you've got a sample that has a lot of element, a bass or, you know, lots of element, that I think it would make sense to work multi-band. Uh, okay, I think, again, for me, multi-band is going to be more of a corrective e tool. Yeah. Rather than a... Than a sound shaping tool anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But of course, it's all personal taste. But it's all personal yeah. taste, but I, 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 yeah. And um, there was a, um, a great question from Atarix is asking, um, in terms of RMS and peak in parallel, which is more effective? Again, depends. I, I think you, use, you tend to use peak mode only for very short, transient yeah. peak limiting. That, I think that, that we can make that rule, more, more or less. Uh, with parallel, we tend to compress heavily. I, I would go with RMS, personally. When I do parallel, I go with RMS. Yeah. Uh, if, you imagine, if you imagine a drum loop, uh, for example, you, I guess you kind of have to think about what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to bring out the peaks, yeah peak mode in parallel to bring out the pops of each sound. If you're trying to bring up the noise floor to give it a kind yeah. of John Bonham style, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. massive drum sound yeah. to use RMS yeah. with a slower yeah. release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even, you know, to be fair, even with the, if I want to bring the pop, you know, the attack, I probably would use RMS with a slow mode. Because the problem with peak is that peak is more, for me, peak is more to get rid of the peaks. Oh, okay. <laughs> really, if I totally, you know, to yeah. make it really, that, that's what it's for. Big peak. Peak, peak is, is fast. Okay, cool. So we got one more question. Um, oh, there's, there's plenty coming in, but we'll try and find one. Uh, uh, Jay Spallis wants to know, um, oh yeah, we just talked about multi-band compression. In mastering though, I mean, compression and limiting and multi-band all take on a new role in mastering. Yeah, yeah. But, so, but, but, but again, I think most professional mastering engineer, which I don't consider myself a, a professional mastering engineer, yeah. um, but most mastering engineer that I know uh, tend to, to steer away from multi-band limiting or compressor. They only use it when there's a real problem, as a fixing tool, rather than... Mm. If, if the balance is there, if, if the thing is really working well, mm. you don't really need to have because it's there, you know. You're only using multiband when suddenly you've got a problem, let's say a massive peak in this region, but the rest of it is okay. So you, you, you can isolate and, and work in slightly finer detail. Yeah. Most master engineers would say, when, even when they use multiband, they use as little, as few band as possible. You know, it's not because you've got a seven band compressor that you need to use the seven. You may use only two mm. to fix those problems. I think that that, that, that really is the, the, the key for me. Yeah, cool. So. Unfortunately, we are out of time. There's still lots of questions coming in, but do come over to our Facebook page and we will continue the discussion there. If you've got any more questions, uh, unfortunately, that is the end of FFL for today. Uh, it was such a massive topic, no surprise, there have been loads of questions, but if you're thirsty for more, our diploma courses cover compression, EQ, mixing, sound engineering, mastering, and much more. And they can be studied here in London or from anywhere in the world on our online school. So check them out on our website, pointblanklondon.com. 
We'll be back next week with another FFL. So we'll see you then. Cheers.